Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SESTA. My name is Gabriel Wolfenstein. I'm the Research and Scholarship Manager uh, up here. And it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce our second to last in our seminar series this quarter. Um, today, we are privileged and fortunate to hear Hannah Walzer and J.D. Porter talk to us about text mining for race and ethnicity in American fiction, 1789 to 1964. Uh, Hannah Walzer earned her PhD from the Department of English here at Stanford in 2016 with a dissertation on 19th century American fiction. Her research is located at the intersection of literature and cognitive science with particular focus on fiction's role in developing new non-normative models of the mind. Um, she is currently the ass assistant director of the Literary Lab and this autumn will join the Harvard Society of Fellows as a junior fellow. J.D. Porter is a PhD candidate in English here at Stanford. His dissertation explains the relationship between social fictions, ideas that once seemed both natural and un uncontroversial, but today are understood more as constructions, uh, and American modernist literary forms. He examines what four social fictions, race, money, gender, and nation, can tell us about that modernism, and what the explorations of the modernists can tell us about our interactions with these social forms today. Today's talk by, uh, by Hannah and J.D. explores how and maps how the frequency and semantic associations of racial, racial and ethnic terms across approximately 18,000 U.S. novels in order to construct a detailed historical picture of American racial, uh, the American racial imaginary. By identifying significant collocates of uh, key racial and ethnic terms at a particular or at particular historic moments, they are going to help us reconstruct the semantic system that gave racial concepts narrative meaning. Um, and before I offer a final introduction, there is a sign-up sheet here that will be passed around. Please do sign up on it um, so that you can join our regular lists if you're not already on them, uh, or just to let us know that you were here. Um, it is, my, again, my great pleasure to introduce J.D. Hannah. Um, welcome. Uh, and thanks everyone for being here. Um, especially thank you to Selena, Mark, and Dylan for setting up the logistical everything. Uh, much appreciated. Um, so, um, so Gabe gave a very nice critique of our talk. And before we jump in, um, I did want to issue a bit of a trigger warning. Um, so, talking about race in uh, particularly 19th century American fiction, really any era of American literature um, uh, often involves looking at offensive language and slurs. Um, we will not be saying any of them, but some of them might be on the screen. So just a heads up, uh, you know, if that makes it um, So uh, we're pretty soon going to get into the data we have and how we can use it to figure out some stuff about um, the history of racial discourse in American literature. Um, before we get into that, though, I just wanted to give a quick overview before I hand it over to JD of kind of what our questions were coming into this project um, and what we hope to find. Um, so there are two kind of branches here. Um, one of them primarily historical, and one of them I think you could say sort of linguistic or cognitive. Um, and the first branch had to do with something we've been calling stickiness. Um, and this kind of cutesy name is just a way of talking about um, how consistent particular um, ethnic discourses are over time. So the history of um, uh, race in America is kind of um, permeated with these narratives about how particular ethnic groups became um, marked or unmarked. So there's a famous book, for instance, um, called How the Irish Became White. Um, there's these kind of positive historical transitions often um, from a kind of a, a racialized status um, to sort of something that seems to be kind of racial invisibility. And so we were interested in seeing kind of testing out these hypotheses in um, literary form because the, the hunch we had, the wager, was that um, if such processes were taking place on a kind of macro social level, that they would be reflected in the language that authors use to describe their characters, that there would be fewer distinctively ethnically marked, um, you know, uh, words surrounding particular um, figures if that racial group was becoming unmarked. 
so we, this is one of the kind of overarching questions is how um, can we track the historical um, stickiness or lack thereof of particular racial concepts. Um, and then the other question emerges um, from work like that of Jennifer Everhart here at Stanford in the psychology department on the concept of implicit bias. Um, so a lot of the research on um, sort of race and social cognition over the past decade or so has focused on these kind of unconscious heuristics um, and biases that sort of shape our interaction with the world, even when we are not consciously creating um, things to ourselves in terms of race. And so part of this project was motivated by asking if we are operating, um, if we can look at American literature, not on the level of kind of one-to-one -one engagement with a single text, but on the level of these subtle linguistic patterns happening over thousands and thousands of texts. Can we detect something like implicit bias on a linguistic level, right? Can we find that whether or not an author is sort of consciously trying to represent a particular ethnic group in one way or another, um, they are nonetheless consistently reaching for the same kinds of terms um, to characterize that group. Um, and if that did kind of show up in some way, you know, we are curious about what linguistic level that would be happening on. Are there syntactic patterns, are there patterns? Of dialect or point of view, how is this? So that's kind of the theoretical background, and now I'm going to hand it over to JP who will talk about um, our data. So, as with a lot of text mining projects, we'll start with the with our corpora. Um, we started off this project with a hand-selected corpus of 193 texts uh, that we thought would probably have racial discourse in them, racial and ethnic discourse. Um, running from 1789 to 1964, these years are picked. 1789 is a pretty good originary year if you want to talk about American fiction. This is when George Washington first takes office, and it's when uh, arguably the first American novel is published. Um, 1964 seemed like a pretty good place to stop because that's the year you get the Civil Rights Act. Also, the next year, you get a gigantic change in American immigration policy where um, the kind of quota system that had dominated for a long time basically goes away. Um, that's kind of the regime that we're still in. Um, then uh, partway through the project, we gained access through the work of the library, and especially uh, Glenn Morley, who's the librarian, he worked with us, to the Yale American Fiction Corpus, which, uh, as you can see, contains just over 18,000 texts. Um, these run from uh, just before 1789, but we kept the original cutoff uh, there, up to 1920. They don't go farther because of copyright reasons. Um, and this is a really great corpus to work with, first of all, because it's so big um, and American-focused, it's covering almost everything that was published in the 19th century. Not quite, not quite everything, but a, a really, really representative sample. And the second thing is that it's based on two bibliographies. Um, so scholarly work kind of went into the creation of this corpus which means that we have a lot of confidence about what, what's in there. Um, we have good metadata on it. We have good sense of how comprehensive it is. So it's like really kind of an ideal corpus to work with if you're trying to cover this period of American literature. What we did from there was we came up with um, first groups and then terms. So first groups oriented around race and ethnicity categories. These were determined by us kind of uh, a priori uh, based on what we knew about American literature, what we kind of thought might be going on on the level of immigration and things like that. Um, there's no pretense to comprehensiveness here or to any kind of like uh, historical empirical reason for these categories. It was just kind of our own best judgment as a place to start. Within each group or category, we came up with terms that we thought would be associated with it. These have a wide variety of contexts. So for instance, in the Native American group, we have things like Sioux and Cherokee. We also have things like, like chief, a more positional thing that you think you might think would be used to describe the person. And of course, we have a lot of, uh, as Hannah said, racial slurs involved in this. Um, so that's going to appear in some of the data that comes up. Um, and, sorry, JD, that's also a priori. Those are these are also a priori. So, like, kind of basically in technical terms, we made like a little dictionary, and we're looking for we're looking for the words that we that we assigned. We came up with the words. They're not uh, emergent, um, except from you know our reading in the past. Um, this is if you just look at the frequency of all of our terms, what you first get. This is on the Gale corpus, and for most of this talk, I'm going to focus on this larger corpus, just because. For, for time reasons, but it's bigger, it's more fun. Um, this is what you get for the appearance of terms associated with each group uh, in each 25-year chunk, except the last chunk is only five years because of uh, how Gale works. Um, 
the thing that surprised me most, I work mainly on African-American fiction, um, and so does Hannah, uh, although she was less surprised by this because she works on 19th century fiction, I think, uh, was just how common Native American terms are. That's what you're seeing on the bottom here. Uh, in, in some eras, the most uh, talked about group uh, based on the dictionaries that we fed in. Um, black also uh, quite doing, doing a really, uh, having a lot of appearances. Um, I should say black contains the word black. Um, and this actually proved to be a, a question that we had to think about a lot in this project. You can see that white people are this pink one and they barely ever show up. If you put the word white in there, it shows up a lot. We weren't sure whether to include these terms. When we went through and looked at the data, it seemed like black was pretty often actually attaching to black people. White was almost never attaching to white people. A uh, recurrent theme in this talk will be that white people are very hard to see. Um, programmatically, when you look at literature, they're just their whiteness is kind of invisible most of the time. Um, it's a, it's an open question. If you've read Toni Morrison's *Playing in the Dark* or like grew up in the South, you know that, that the use of terms white and black, even when not obviously attached to people, still often have racial significance. Um, the South used to ban books that showed children's books that showed white and black rabbits playing together. Um, so. Uh, even when the word doesn't clearly associate to a person, it still might have racial significance, but we just kind of had to make a call at, at a certain point on which ones we wanted to keep and which ones we wanted to exclude. This will keep coming up in, in the talk. Um, here you can see some actual census data running from 1850 to 1930 about who, who was coming into the country. Um, what's interesting here is if you notice Chinese and East Asian grows a lot as you head into our last period. Eastern European still grows, but is doing is appearing less than Chinese and East Asian towards the end. Meanwhile, on the actual census data, we see that Eastern European is, is uh, exploding. China, Chinese and East Asian immigration is not. This is probably because of a, an act, the Chinese Exclusion Act that came out in the 1880s um, and stayed in force through this period, uh, mostly until the 1920s. So the literary imaginary is not actually 100% reflective of actual demographic reality in the US. This is, this is something to keep in mind as we go forward. Here's if you zoom to the level of terms. Before I was showing you categories, this, this, this is terms. Um, and you can see, for instance, Indian having a lot of sway. But here again is where you see the color word kind of come in. Black is really dominating for that. Um, and then there's a few others on there. Uh, we can come back to any of these in Q&A if you guys are interested. One thing, one example of kind of a sanity check on how well this is working and also just a really interesting finding and also evidence that there was so many more findings in this that were kind of beyond our own expertise immediately. These are uh, specific Native American tribes as they, just based on the frequency with which they're showing up in the text. Um, the most obvious thing you'll notice is this giant spike in the second period. Um, the, our theory is that this has to do with James Fenimore Cooper's popularity. Small corrective, actually. This weirdly predates Cooper's Native American novel. So my theory is dead. I don't have a new one. <laughs> there was a kind of early 19th century <laughs> sort of romantic depictions of the frontier. Um, but in any case, huh. it might not be Cooper. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's like the place Cooper emerged from. But um, what, what you'll notice that's really interesting on a relative level is if you look in this early period, you see a lot of you see a lot of references to, for instance, the Iroquois, the Lenape, the Mohegans. These are all Eastern U.S. tribes. Um, as you move out into the lat latter period, you get Sioux, Apache, the Cherokee are always are always quite present, Navajo, that sort of thing. So as you move west in actual U.S. expansion. Um, of where white people who wrote novels in English were living, you actually get a uh, representation of the new tribes that would have been encountered in a way where, where it's almost as though the, the, uh, the removal of people from their land and everything uh, corresponds with their representation in fiction. Yeah. I apologize for this, but is this per hundred books or, or is it total? This is, this is scaled, but I don't remember, I don't remember what we know. It's per words, um, so I think it's per hundred thousand words. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't the, the absolute here isn't just the relative is what's important for this part of it. Um, so yeah, you get this this weird sort of like real world erasure <laughs> corresponding with literary representation. Um, obviously not total erasure, but removal of land. Well, and quick like question about this: and how did you decide on the terms? Like which tribes did you? How did you identify which tribes you were going to be looking? For? Uh, the, this was like every other term that we used, just kind of a uh, decision that we made. Um, uh, I did look at the tribes with the most people in them, 
um, and try and pick. There were many that aren't even on this list because they just didn't show up enough. Um, these are the ones that appeared enough to, to make it onto the chart. Um, but there, there are more than this. Again, not comprehensive, but it is. In most lot. cases, with our terms, we started with a longer list and then found that many of the terms we um, selected just didn't show up. Yeah. This yeah. is kind of the highlight version. Right, right. Um, OK, so that was frequency. We'll turn now to collocates. So just a quick uh, overview, if anybody does, is not familiar with the, the method here. Here's a chunk of text. This is the kind of thing we're working with. A lot of times in Gale, there are OCR errors. In other words, when the book was scanned, not all the words are accurate. Um, but it's it's pretty close and usually tends to wash out of the data for our purposes. So you pick a target word. Here's a chunk from Moby Dick. Here's the word Oriental sitting in the middle of this paragraph. Then you look at uh, the words on either side of it. Uh, in our case, we went five before and five after. Um, and that's what you see in green here. Um, and then and then you can consider those to be collocates of, of the target word because they're appearing close to it. The window size can change. This is the one we used. Um, and then, then here you have, you know, for your target term, all of these things connecting to it. This random example we picked is already really interesting. <laughs> Oriental is relating to unchanging Asiatic, East, et cetera. Um, uh, for, for our purposes, what makes a collocate interesting is if it's appearing more frequently than you would expect, what we call observed over expected. So like the is not really interesting because you always, you almost always would expect the to show up within the five words on either side of a word. But Asiatic is not usually going to show up. Um, if we just looked at any random word, the word table, we would probably not expect to see Asiatic. So it's based on how frequently the word shows up <clears throat> compared to how it would show up if you took a random 10 word chunk, 11 word chunk of text. Um, what this resulted in for us is, in our, is like kind of a fantastic number of collocates. In our small corpus, 5,600, in our large corpus, uh, 142,000 unique words appearing as collocates of some or another target term that we had. This is, this is a, a reasonably long novel. Um, of just unique words that are collocates of these terms um, and a high percentage of everything in English. So in order to like make this intelligible, we have to put various filters on it, either setting certain observed over expected thresholds, like this is showing up way more than we would expect it to, or, or calling based on just pure number of appearances, where it has to show up, say, 100 times to, to make the list. Um, uh, there's a, like I said, this is just a ton of data and it's produced a ton of findings. So we'll just talk about a couple of ways that we've uh, tried to make this intelligible. The first one is Voronoi diagrams. This is a Mark Algie Hewitt, the other person on the project uh, specialty. Um, and here's, here's where the, some of the uh, slurs and other kinds of terms are going to start showing up. Um, so here is a Voronoi diagram of all of our target terms. Uh, uh, from 1789 to 1920, well, not all of them made the list, but, but um, arranged by uh, whether they share collocates. So if, if a word here shares a, a collocate with another, or shares a, a bunch of collocates with another word, then it shows up next to it. For instance, you might expect Polish and Irish to share Catholic, um, and then they might have a border. Uh, paradox, uh, not paradoxically, but counterintuitively, the smaller a thing is, the more the more kind of embedded it is with other words. Um, makes sense when you think about it. It means it can have more borders and more centrally located. Um, just looking at it this way, you already begin to see a bunch of interesting stuff. Here are a bunch of Native American terms. So you can see those clustering together. Here again, kind of a nice sanity check. It indicates that terms surrounding Native Americans are sharing collocates. That shows that the methodology is potentially functioning. Um, here we have derogatory terms. Everything here is a racial slur. The colors are refer to the, the different categories that these terms fit into. And the fact that you're seeing so many colors here indicates that up here we have kind of a racial slurs discourse that seems to be floating free, a little bit free of any particular race or ethnicity. Uh, the language of, of uh, hatred and derogatoriness seems to have kind of it's a unique discourse all its own. Um, if we try and look at it historically, here's our first period. There aren't very many books in this period in American history. So you get a very small diagram. It just has German, Greek, Irish, Italian, and a couple of other things on it. Um, as you move forward in time, uh, you begin to see kind of some interesting things. For instance, here are Catholic terms in this period, 1815 to 1839. This is, as you know, if you do US history kind of stuff, period of rising anti-Catholic sentiment. There are whole political parties based on this. 
um, it's kind of interesting to see these, these beginning to cluster and show up with a lot of frequency. Um, in this period, we have two different discourses for African Americans. This up here has words like quadroon and mulatto. It seems to be litigating who's, who can be a slave. Down here, we have more kind of uh, slurs, which seems to be kind of um, just more generalized uh, racism. After the Civil War, there's only one African American discourse showing up on the chart. Um, kind of a collapse there. We wouldn't want to like speculate too much about uh, whether there's a particular regional character to that, although in other research, I, we found that sometimes it seems like the North adopts what the South was saying, even as the politics shift. Um, these just kind of keep going forward in time. Um, I don't think we have time to talk about this. Um, but uh, we can come back to any of them again if you have questions. So all of this is kind of a way to look at all of this data and try to make it intelligible to us. But as Hannah said, one of our originary questions was, what's going on with racial discourse around each, each uh, kind of group over the course of time, what we're calling stickiness? Do, does the terminology uh, around one group solidify early and stay versus another group being more flexible? Um, this turns out to be a very complicated thing to try and figure out. Um, in part because uh, because they're just radically different numbers of texts in each period, things are showing up or not showing up. So I'll walk through one way that we've started to look at it, um, but this will be uh, something we'd love to hear more about from you guys in um, Q and A period. Um, all right. So here we have our group Catholic. We have a bunch of terms that collocate with Catholic. Um, and then we have periods in the columns here. The numbers are the observed over expected score, but what's important, what's important here is the, is the color shows just kind of how intense it is. And if it's blue, it means that the term is showing up in that period. If it's white, the term's not showing up in that period. Yeah. And how did you determine uh, what observed over expected is? Uh, how did you determine a baseline for this? Expected is the frequency of the term in the entire corpus, uh, just in general. So if the word if the word um, religion shows up one every thousand words, that's your expect you have a one in one thousand chance of seeing it, uh, or I guess you know one in a thousand over eleven of seeing it in a particular place. Um, uh, observed is how often it actually shows up. So if we see religion with Catholic more than one in a thousand times, it means that it's showing up more than we would expect, right? And in many cases, it, uh, something like religion and Catholic is going to show up perhaps you know one in a hundred times. So that's a high observed over expected. Um, that, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So yeah, darkness of the color shows uh, how intense the the, co the collocation is, um, and uh, whether there's a color shows whether it exists. So here for Catholic, Roman and Church are are arguably highly sticky. They're showing up in the 1815 period, and they're going all the way to the last period. And then as you get narrower, that, end, that, that is a bit of a proxy for less stickiness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it kind of rings true. Roman church and Catholic all seem to have high stickiness. As you get down here, you have discourse that surrounds Catholicism, but is a little bit less attached to it. Um, uh, and, and I should say there's good examples here of this discourse isn't always like explanatory of the thing. Sometimes it's just what people are talking about when they talk about the thing. For instance, Protestant shows up with Catholic. This is just an artifact of Excel, that if you write the word true in a cell, it, it thinks it's a Boolean thing and turns it into true in all caps. But I thought it was kind of funny to have that <laughs> on a religion. Um, so if we take this basic principle, here we can see that applied to all of our groups zoomed way out. And you can just kind of see what they all look like. So the kind of longer a thing is, the more terms have, have some kind of stickiness with, with, uh, with the group. And the more like fractured you start to get here, you can see that stickiness is going down, or in this case, that it's kind of disappeared. This is black. This is our, our group for, for black people. And you can see a high degree of stickiness. This is one of our original hypotheses, is that there may be more stickiness in discussing African Americans than there would be in discussing an immigrant group like the Irish, who, who supposedly are able to assimilate. Um, the Irish appear right here. So, so Pretty high stickiness, actually, but much less than, than African American. And then here, here we have Native American. So even higher stickiness than black, it looks like if you're just visualizing it. Um, I guess I can tell you what these all are. Black, Catholic, Chinese slash East Asian, Eastern European, German or Dutch, 
immigrants didn't turn out to have much in itself, but that's probably just an artifact of how we populated it. Scandinavian, Irish, Italian, Jewish, Latin American slash Spanish, a lot of times it refers to people from Spain, Middle Eastern slash Muslim, Native American, and white. White had, had relatively low stickiness, but again, very hard to detect white people in, in these forms. Once again, the color words come up. Um, if you leave black in, this is what the category black looks like. If you take it out, this is what it looks like. Even more important was, was with apologies, yellow for Chinese slash East Asian, where that really took away most of the colleges. You also see here that this column is almost always longer than the other columns. That's because there's many more texts in that period, which makes it easier. My cutoff here was whether there was at least 100 observations. It's easier to have 100 observations if you have more texts. So it just looks longer. This is an example of it's very difficult to figure out <laughs> the trade-off. Because appearing more does mean that something is being talked about more and that there is kind of a discourse surrounding it. So you don't want to cut that off entirely, even though you're also interested in percentage type terms. And here's what all this looks like if you do the numbers on it. Um, the, the black amended and Chinese East Asian amended are, are without the, those two terms, black and yellow. Um, and the, the, this shows just how many of those little cells are blue. How many total things are blue? So that's kind of like, how often is there a collocate for the word? Stickiness shows if a term shows up, how many periods does it show up in? So if you see um, religion with Catholic, do you see it again in the next term? And, and it turns out that you do. So that's kind of what we're using as a loose, rough proxy for stickiness at the moment. Um, you see that, that black with the color word in there is highly sticky, but if you take it out, Less, still, still pretty sticky though, even though you've taken away about 80% of the, the collocates. Much more extreme with Chinese and East Asian. If you remove that, you lose 90% of the collocates and the stickiness drops almost all the way to the bottom. Um, but the, the stickiest term, so probably the real story for black is somewhere in between, since the word black does do a lot of work in the discourse around, around uh, African Americans. Um, Native American being the most sticky uh, if you do the amended thing. Catholic being kind of kind of high too, and then so on down the line, um, and uh, that is the that is the kind of stickiness place that we are now. And, and as I say, something we'd really be interested to hear your thoughts on uh, in the Q and A. Yeah. So to wrap up, um, I'm just going to kind of bring it back to a kind of sentence level or semantics level, because um, we've been talking on a fairly abstract level about shared collocates without really going into what those collocates are or what they might mean. Um, so I'm going to do that and I will reiterate my trigger warning for anyone who came in late. Um, there are going to be slurs up here, um, but I'm not going to. Yeah. Um, okay, so we were looking just now at um, some racial categories, including black, right? And we were treating it as a bit of a monolith. We were interested in how the collection of terms that can be used to refer to uh, African Americans or African American characters um, changed over time. Um, but when we split this off into distinct terms, we can actually see different semantic fields um, arising around particular um, terms associated with African American people. And so here um, is just an example of a few. Um, so if you look at, for instance, Negro on the top, um, what you see is uh, a very politically inflected discourse. I would argue, based on um, you know, uh, American history, that this is kind of the language of the quote unquote Negro problem. Um, so you have disenfranchisement, uh, amalgamation, insurrections, and you also have um, kind of stereotypes of criminality. Um, so something like rapists. Um, if you look at, on the other hand, the term African by itself, um, you have an implicit narrative of colonialism that is much more strong. And this is often coming um, in practice from uh, the dime novels um, in our corpus, um, which have a kind of distinctly colonialist bent. It's worth noting that Asiatic is also in there and that there's this kind of comparative racialization going on um, among kind of non-white European ethnic groups. Um, if you look at the N-word, um, you see a lot of dialect terms. And one thing we can talk about more in question period is how dialect terms associate with different ethnic groups. It's often quite unexpected, at least for me. Um, if you look at slave at the bottom, kind of in contrast to the N-word, um, you see sort of the two groups that JD was talking about earlier in the Verona diagrams, right? You have the slurs and you have this kind of legalistic discourse, Freeman, Bondman, 
uh, quadrillion octoroon of sort of who gets included in the category of slave. And this is a particularly, um, you know, in some ways a particularly antebellum discourse, but continues through um, kind of the Jim Crow era um, in terms of determining access. <laughs> Um, Ethiopian was an interesting outlier for us. Uh, we were not sure at first why there were so many musical terms. Uh, it turns out there was a very popular uh, minstrel group in the NFL period known as the Ethiopian Serenaders. Um, and actually one of the interesting things that we can talk about in the question period um, are the ways that um, kind of performance and sort of um, theatrical spaces get absorbed into novels in this period um, surrounding the question of race, because that actually came up quite a lot, um, that white characters were often reminiscing fondly about things like minstrel shows rather than actually um, talking about African-American people. Um, you can do something similar um, within kind of various European categories. Um, and, you know, there's almost like a sort of fun spot the stereotype game you can play, the Dutch cheeses, windmills, navigators, merchantmen, um, burgomaster, um, Germans are academics or they're militaristic, right? Um, and uh, Eastern Europeans, we thought, with, you know, apologies to here, were one of the most hilarious because they combine radical politics with classical music. <laughs> so <laughs> Russian is the best example, nihilist, violinist, ballet, revolutionist. Um, so, it, you know, this is one potential kind of use of this data is just um, getting a sense of the semantic associations around particular ethnic terms. Um, one thing as you do this, you can start to kind of develop hypotheses um, that uh, have to do with kind of more generalizable um, features of ethnic discourse. So one of the things that came to mind um, when we were looking at the uh, um, collocates for East Asian uh, target terms um, is that they seem to include a lot of just physical objects and more so than many of the other ethnicities did. Um, so you see here butterflies and verses, very popular, but also something like silk or calligraphy. And even when they were referring to um, human subjects, they often did so in a way that was um, sort of breaking them down into component parts. So things like face, um, eyes was also in there, I believe. Um, and this reminded me of uh, an argument by Anne Cheng, who is a scholar of uh, comparative race theory, and uh, who has talked about ornamentalism as a kind of discourse surrounding um, East Asian women in particular, um, where objects get invested with some form of personhood and vice versa. Um, and so I got interested in whether um, this was something that I was just sort of projecting onto the data, if it was actually there. Um, so I, uh, we went in, um, filtered the collocates only to words that, according to the Corpus of Historical American English, are primarily used as nouns. Um, within those nouns, it was a relatively small set. I just had to manually for nouns that can refer to people versus nouns that do not. That includes objects and abstractions and, for instance, animals. And then you can just look at the ratio of the two across different categories. Um, so as you can see, the number varies pretty substantially. But here, the blue band um, are nouns that uh, do not refer to persons. Um, the orange band um, are those that do. Um, and as you can see, the, the blue predominates, the non-person nouns predominate in almost all of these. Um, but if you look at the ratio, what you can get is something that's almost a kind of inanimacy score, or a score for how likely an ethnicity is to appear modifying the person, right? Um, so initial hypothesis about East Asian terms turned out to be right. I should say that this is without um, the color terms that were, uh, you know, creating kind of false positives. Um, but what was interesting, and at first counterintuitive, and then immediately once I thought about it, it made sense, um, was that terms associated with white, um, the you know, white racial identity were actually the least likely to be associated with people. And at first this was confusing in that, you know, the um, white characters vastly predominate in the corpus we're looking at, but of course they are almost never labeled as such, right? And so when the terms like European or Anglo-Saxon or whatever um, show up in these texts, they are modifying things like nation or coalition or heritage or concepts like that, um, usually abstractions rather than physical objects. Um, so this is a, you know, a potentially kind of interesting prompt for future research. Um, also interesting would be the terms that the other extremes that do mostly show up 
um, as people rather than as objects. Um, and there, Irish, Jewish, uh, and kind of the general concept of immigrants um, show up groups that are often kind of imagined as um, having a trajectory of assimilation during this period, which is kind of interesting. Um, so just going quickly through um, a few of the other ways you can kind of approach this data. Um, one would be to pair, um, to look at kind of bigrams, right, where um, particular ethnic terms show up either modifying nouns or being modified by adjectives, right? And so one initial breakdown that seemed interesting to me based on, again, the kind of historical hypotheses that we're trying to make um, was old and young, right? When these characters are represented, are they represented as kind of youthful, um, as sort of active, as, um, you know, uh, kind of future oriented, or are they represented as sort of being consigned to the past? What you find is that um, old is an adjective that really readily attaches to racial slurs, especially but not exclusively for African American characters. Um, and this, you know, you can look at the quotes here. Um, if you're interested, I won't read them. But um, the, I think the kind of logic here is one of familiarity um, to the point of contempt, I guess you could say. That is, um, there seems to be a kind of nostalgic aura around, you know, this person has been on the plantation for decades, this person um, raised me when I was a child, and now I'm a grown man, and I'm reflecting back on that. So there's this kind of um, consignment to a sort of nostalgic past that fits very well with um, kind of, especially the um, postbellum rhetoric surrounding um, African Americans. In the US, um, I'm going to kind of skip over this quickly, but we can come back to it. Um, other kind of coded as old ethnicities. Um, as for young, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, this often seems to modify heroic or sexually desirable characters. Um, and they're often racially ambiguous or mixed race. So young Mulatto was a very common um, uh, call kit pair. If you look at those, one of the interesting kind of patterns that you find um, examining these moments in the text is that um, there's this kind of recurring scene of a white person summoning a mixed race servant who um, is described in extremely sort of laudatory and kind of um, fascinated terms, um, but who is then kind of quickly dismissed from the story. So you have this character who is young and active, a young and active um, who exists solely to deliver a piece of information. So there's this kind of odd tension between um, the kind of semantic associations of this concept and the narrative work that these characters are being asked to do. Um, another point of interest, young Jew, these phrase, this phrase is often used um, to characterize kind of upstart or sort of socially upwardly mobile characters. Um, and I wanted to focus, uh, to, to pick out this last quote here in particular, um, because it seems like a really nice kind of emblem of how these kind of adjectival stereotypes can sort of compound eventually into something more resembling um, a character. So out of this mass of clerklings emerged two or three who were interesting. Sam Weintraub, a young, active, redheaded, slim-waisted Jew who was born in Brooklyn, right? So you have here this kind of, you know, in a sense, like, colicate heavy language in the sense of um, sort of shoehorning in all these descriptive adjectives in between um, kind of the, the determinant and the noun. Um, and the effect is to kind of uh, pick out this character from this undifferentiated mass, right? Um, I wanted to end on uh, gender here um, and to note a couple things. Um, so if you look at the word girl, um, which immediately stood out to me as kind of having that distinctive sort of exoticizing tinge to the collocates um, or to the target terms that were collocated with it, um, you find that it's typically being modified by an ethnicity as an adjective. And when you look at the situations in which these characters are actually occurring, um, they're almost interchangeable, right? They're all exoticized and eroticized in a similar degree. Um, and this is actually kind of nicely emblematized in this quote um, from one of the novels. Uh, he hated girls in general, the genus girl of which Irish Lizzie was a specimen. Right. So there's this kind of framework in which gender is seen as a primary category that's sort of being inflected or is subcategorized by race or ethnicity. Um, what's, you know, in a sense, that's 
kind of what this data points to, but there's also a sense in which it's um, kind of demarcating a different kind of gender category, which is the ethnically marked girl, right, that is like interchangeable within itself. Um, so I expected to find something similar looking at the word man, right, that the ethnic term would be working as an adjective modifying it. Um, and that's what I found in many of the cases, um, but not for Indian and not for the N-word. Um, and in both of those cases, um, the term is actually appearing as a noun frequently in contrast with the phrase white man. So these terms aren't modifying man, they're being opposed to it in the context of this biogram white man. Um, so, you know, uh, a nice example here, just casually referring to a sloop called the sea fox, manned by a white man, an Indian, and a dog, right? So there's this kind of, um, uh, you know, placing the, the phrase an Indian in this kind of middle position, um, both grammatically and kind of um, ontologically. Um, and this got me interested in where this phrase white man appears, because um, as we talked about, you know, um, it's pretty difficult to kind of pick out white characters as such um, when they are so typically linguistically unmarked, right? So I started looking for it, and what I found um, was that it's a common diagram almost always showing up in the speech or in the free and direct discourse associated with ethnically marked characters. So the narratorial voice, which is usually in these texts presumed to be white, does not typically refer to someone as a white man, but a character who is marked as African-American, Native American, whatever it might be, um, is made to refer to others as a white man. Um, sometimes in direct discourse, sometimes in kind of indirect vocalization. Um, and this struck me as really interesting and kind of a, an evocative point to end on, because when you're looking at um, this kind of phenomenon, what you're seeing is that um, the kind of recognition and maintenance of racial difference is being foisted off onto these characters who are themselves racially marked, right? Um, it's a sort of an abdication of responsibility on the part of kind of the presumed white narrator um, for this very carefully constructed um, white identity um, that is, you know, kind of invisibly sustaining these texts. Um, there's a lot more you can say about it, um, but I think that is a good place and time to stop. Um, and yeah, thanks very much. And we look forward to your comments. I have a question in uh, kind of in relation to the pulling out the color words because what uh, in relation actually to the Native American words. Now what I'm curious about is whether you did any closer examination of times in which native or the Native American was used as a nativist sort of thing as opposed to applying to First Nations, particularly at particular moments in, in American history. And so there may be times when that term is being used but not being used to describe Native Americans as we would understand Native Americans? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, based on the kind of pulling out keywords and context that I was doing, um, I did not really see many instances of that. Um, certainly the term American is often used kind of to designate uh, you know, someone who is supposed to have been here for generations, right? And that's usually uh, contrasted to some other recent immigrant or some other ethnicity. Um, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't, see much evidence of the term Native American being used. Or just Native. Native. Or just Native, yeah. Um, it's possible that, you know, that's in there. Uh, native moves around a little bit. When you look at the uh, politics for Native, mm -hmm. it seems to be mostly about Native Americans, um, but not entirely. Uh, the the other, other colicates that kind of indicate that that is where the discourse is, is that land is one of the top uh, colicates for the group attaching to Indian. Um, and uh, although both of those, I believe, have some some Latin American inflection midway through when you're in the sort of like Bolivarian revolutionary period, um, uh, American, meanwhile, is one of the top colicates for white. Um, when you, there's not very many that attach to white for long, um, but but uh, American was one of them. Um, I forget which target term it attached to. So yeah, there is some ambiguity there, and there is with any of these terms because they're they're semantically we're treating them as as like monolithic tokens, but they're semantically ambiguous. Um, 
this is an interesting kind of give and take because when you say native, if you've been using it to talk about Indians for, for 50 years and then you use it to talk about Irish, there may be hints of that pre-existing discourse and how you're talking about the Irish, but it is also true that you are talking about the Irish now. So um, there's give and take, but it seemed empirically like it was mostly about, about Americans. Uh, given just the, the extent to which anti-immigrant uh, sentiment has, has in, in non-white opposition has often historically been manifested in, in images of uncleanliness or impurity, how often did, I mean, did notions of hygiene and, uh, and impurity come up in your collocates? Yeah, that was a, a kind of semantic field that I also expected, right? Um, and I was kind of surprised by how little we saw it, with the exception, um, interestingly, of Irish. Um, there were, there was a fairly robust sort of, especially late 19th century discourse of, um, of dirtiness uh, surrounding Irish uh, immigrants, um, but not in that many other cases. Um, and in fact, there were some sort of inversions of that um, that you saw with uh, charges, for instance, in the East Asian category, where there was an actual emphasis on kind of um, luxury on sort of um, uh, kind of artistic, you know, ornament and decadence and so on, um, and, as opposed to kind of like the others. Yeah, no, it, it didn't rise to the top. It wasn't one of the like main things that we saw, which surprised us too. Um, with disease, you saw a little bit. I did a spot check on that at one point, and uh, it had high associations with East Asians, although a lot of that was was the word yellow because of like yellow fever. Um, but even if you remove that, still kind of present. And then for for uh, African American, um, stayed higher. So it didn't really follow the pattern that we expected, um, but it may be in there, and we just haven't seen it. That's kind of the caveat for all of this. Yeah, but yeah, that was one where we were where we were very primed to catch it and we didn't. So it seems likely that it's not there. Yeah. Thank you for an excellent and thought provoking talk. This is really fascinating. I'm wondering if all right. So you have the, looking at the the numbers and words in the large corpus in these large periods. And I'm wondering what that also masks. And you both hinted at this as well. If you were to tighten up the periodizations, for instance, we have periods when we know yellow peril is something that comes up a lot, um, or you know, or sort of similarly. So that question one: Are the time periods that you've broken down to too wide to catch some of these various, some of the very interesting changes in this discourse? And similarly, um, although the you know the big corpus does give you a sense of these wider discourses. If you were to narrow those down into categories of works, Penny Dreadfuls, Dime Store, et cetera, right, which have different audiences, different communities, different you know, um, yeah, points, words, et cetera, collocates that are going to engage. I'm wondering what might start to show up. If you've already done this, or are you thinking of doing this, or is there a reason not to do this? The genre thing in particular is the next step that we have quite a bit. Um, I'm particularly interested, like you said, in looking at um, kind of the language of the Western, which we talked about and thought about when we were constructing our smaller corpus, and then also kind of dime novels um, with these colonialistic kind of overtones. Um, so that is a yes and on my part. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about yeah, well, this. I mean, this points to like a, a issue that affects digital humanities and text mining in general, um, and that we try to be very conscious of in this project is the constant push and pull between uh, the kind of subjective top-down stuff that we have to do to get anything, right. and the stuff that's emergent from the data. So like one reason we were comfortable with doing the dictionary approach where we just picked terms was that we thought if there were terms we missed, they might emerge. If we if we found any kind of a discourse, for instance, if we left out, if it turns out that like the, the black, Blackfoot tribe is showing up a lot and we forgot to put that term in there or overlooked it, that maybe it would emerge from the data. Similarly with, with periodization and genre, that like, 
that you might be able to see, oh, there's like a heavy concentration of the word peril in this period. What's, what's going on? And, and that things might emerge. On the other hand, what you put in the first place has a big impact on what can emerge. So it's a constant push and pull where, where we're not quite to the stage of having like gone very far in that dialectic yet. But, um, but we ought to be able to, to continue to do, to do slices. And, and also it should, be, it should be noted to get feedback from people who know about these things about things we may have missed, um, which is something that we're trying to be really attentive to, too. I will say one early indication of, of things is in that Native American graph that showed which tribes were showing up, there is a, a, a bit of a genre distinction visible there, where the last part is Westerns. The first part is these kind of romances that Hannah mentioned. Whether there are romances because of where people were when they were writing, mm -hmm. and Westerns because of where people were, yeah. or whether whether people are writing about these things because the Western becomes codified versus the romance being codified is an interesting example in the real world of exactly the kind of dialectic that I'm talking about. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you for very interesting research. I have two questions. Uh, one is in your category, your racial category, um, you chose the term um, black as opposed to Negro or Negroid, is there any reason that you did that? You mean in our in our display, like as our top down? In your research, as you looked for for those terms to come out of the literature. So within we had this kind of um, two level structure, right? And on one level was kind of um, uh, overarching categories, and on another level was specific target terms. So within the target terms, we did include uh, Negro. You know, um, a lot of the other terms you saw up there. Um, we were referring to it as black from the kind of uh, higher level category um, instance, mostly just, uh, well, I don't know. Do you want to address? Yeah, yeah. So we did look for the word Negro. We looked for Negroid, um, things like that in, as, as terms within the category. The, the word black that you're seeing on the screen when we show the data is our, is our own top down designation for the collection of all of those words, as Hannah said. Um, and we, we went with Black as opposed to like African American, um, I guess that's the word I usually use when I write about this this stuff in general as as a more capacious term to catch people like, for instance, I write about Claude McKay, who's not quite African American because he's from Jamaica, but he did call himself black. So um, that's the term we went with. It could have been something else, but it, but in the research we do have kind of those older those older designations. Do you have a second? And, and then yes. Um, did you look at all at the um, racial uh, group of the authors of these? Uh, this is also the next step um, that we're really uh, hoping to test out on that smaller corpus first. One of the frustrations with the big corpus of 18,000 um, is that the author metadata doesn't really include anything to that effect. Um, but on this smaller control corpus of about 200 texts, we can um, break out author uh, <coughs> groups of, you know, based on racial identity. Um, and so one of the things we've been kind of experimenting with, um, yeah, is seeing whether these discourses show up differently um, when the author deploying them is white um, versus African American versus, yeah. you know, Latino or whatever it might be. Yeah. We've had some early findings on that yeah. um, with a much smaller, again, group of texts. For instance, um, I think we found that. Uh, Black characters and characters is a whole other can of worms of trying to identify what's a character. Um, but that you were more often like you were more likely to see, for instance, black people in the subject position of a sentence versus the object position in black authored works, yeah. um, which is kind of an unsurprising finding. But that's the sort of thing we've been seeing in our in our smaller experimentation. But we haven't figured out how to scale it up because the the Gale Corpus, for instance, doesn't tell us what the what the race of the author is. I would also like to, for instance, have the, ge the geographical Mm -hmm. origin of the author to see what is Southern discourse versus Northern discourse versus Western discourse, which people are writing about more and more as a unique kind of racial um, situation. Um, so we're starting on that, but we haven't gotten very far. It would also be interesting to see what's happening politically at those times as well. Yeah, marking it, marking it just with like, here's where the Civil War starts and here's what happens is, is uh, an intuitive thing to do. Yeah, or like, you know, top down sort of immigration policy or whatever. Yeah, we've kind of gestured to that um, on like in these general sort of 25 year chunks, but it would be nice to get more granular about like how fast, how quickly, if at all, do we see effects in literature from 